Recently, I've had quite a few people ask me about taking nightscape images with a standard camera fitted with a kit lens. Well, tonight's the night to see how we go with that setup. Right, so as most of you know, I shoot most of my nightscapes with Nikon full frame cameras and fast aperture lenses. So um, I only own one crop sensor camera, and here it is. It's a Nikon D7100. I used it quite a lot for sport shooting about six years ago. This is a kit lens, an 18 to 55 widest aperture of f3.5. So this is the baby we're gonna to shoot tonight. Let's get on with it and see what we can do. The vast majority of people who are contemplating nightscape photography begin with the camera that they already own. And in many cases, that's a crop sensor DSLR with a standard 18 to 55 kit lens. So I'm here at a location I've shot at before because I wanted to find a quiet spot to test this camera and lens combination. And here we go. All right, so you're probably wondering what the difference is between a full frame camera and a crop sensor camera. Well, essentially a full frame camera is a 35 millimeter format, which has been around for years since the film days, years and years ago. And, um, when digital cameras were um, introduced back in the early 2000s, um, they decided to make a smaller sensor, which uh, is known as a crop sensor. So it's actually a smaller sensor than a full frame. Now, uh, with this Nikon D7100, it's actually what's known as a 1.5 crop factor. So the sensor in my D750 or my Z6 is actually 1.5 times larger than the sensor in this camera. Now what that means is that the larger sensor in those other cameras is um, going to capture more light quicker than this smaller sensor in this camera. Therefore, you've got to push the ISO up higher, you've got to have faster lenses, everything you can do just to get more light to come in to, the, to hit the sensor. So with the full frame cameras, um, they operate better at high ISO and they have a greater dynamic range. There's a, there's a few things going for them, of course, but the purpose of this exercise is to try out this crop sensor because a lot of you guys have got them out there, especially with the kit lens. This is an 18 to 55 uh, widest aperture of f3.5. So let's see how we go with that. Okay, so how am I gonna set this camera up? Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is set the camera to its widest um, focal length, which in this case is 18 millimeters. Now at 18 millimeters with this lens, the widest aperture I can put in is f3.5. So that's what I'm gonna do, f3.5. I'm gonna take, uh, firstly, I'm gonna try a few single shots at uh, 15 second exposures, and I'm gonna set the ISO at 3200. And we'll see how we go with that. But what I wanna do is a little bit later after that is experiment with taking a number of shots and I'm gonna use some um, stacking later on in a free program for Windows called Sequitor. And uh, what that will do will help alleviate the noise that's generated through the sensor of these smaller crop sensors. So I can boost the ISO a bit higher, then stack a number of images together to get that result. And by the way, um, I've set the white balance at 3450 Kelvin because I'm gonna do some white, uh, light painting on this old tractor and with my torch with the uh, orange CTO gel, it's a half CTO gel, and uh, that should balance out the colors nicely while still giving me a nice, rich, uh, bluish tinge in the night sky. So, let's give it a go. All right, so immediately I've run into a problem, and that is with focusing. Now, what I'm used to doing with my D750, the Z6, is putting the camera into live view, uh, 
cranking up the ISO, using the focus ring and being able to see stars in there and to be able to bring them in and out of focus. Now, two problems with this camera and this lens. One, I can't see any stars in the back of the view screen because I can only open up to f3.5. That's one problem. The second problem is this is an absolute fly-by wire focus. There are no markings on the lens. I don't know when it's anywhere near infinity focus. No idea. So they're two pretty major issues. Now, I do have a solution. Firstly, with the live view screen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to frame up the tractor here and then I'm going to use a depth of field chart to work out where my infinity focus point is. Now, if you've never heard of this focus method, uh, just have a look at this video that I've got linked up above here, and that goes through it in more detail than what I can do tonight. But what I will do is very briefly show you how it works. So what I have on my tablet here is a PhotoPills app, and PhotoPills have got a depth of field chart, which is quite a, um, a very, very uh, comprehensive uh, little program, Photo Pills. There's a lot of things on it and it's fantastic. So, okay, so here we have the app and I'm going to go to the one that says Depth of Field Table. Click on that. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, click on the camera. Now, that's not the camera I want because I've got a D750 in there. And there's all of the different cameras listed here. Um, I've got to just whip right down to the Nikon. Okay, there it is, D7100. I'm going to click on that. Now, it comes up with the focal length is my next button I'm going to press over here. And my focal length is 18 millimeters. Remember, it's an 18 millimeter lens at its widest. So now I've now clicked onto 18 millimeters. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is work out the aperture. So the aperture is f3.5. You can see that listed there. Then what I'm going to do is simply scroll up until I get an infinity focus marking. I know it's a little bit difficult to see there on screen, but that little figure eight, sideways figure eight there is telling me that this chart is telling me that at five meters distance, I have infinity focus. Now, if you look at the video that I've produced earlier, uh, you'll remember that I suggested to have a margin for error. So what I'm saying to you is if I set my lens at f3.5, and I measure out about six to seven meters, I will have infinity focus. So let's give it a go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is measure out from the camera. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> seven meters, the front of the tractor from the camera. So all I need to do is focus on the front of the tractor and I will have infinity focus. All right, so I've got my focus where I think it should be, focused on the very front of the tractor. Now, what I normally tell people to do is to focus first before you confirm your composition. So in other words, uh, what I often see, especially with these cameras that don't have flip screens, you get down close to the ground and then you're standing on your head trying to get a composition. And then you think, oh no, I haven't focused yet. So you've got to stand on your head and try and focus. It's too hard, guys. The easiest thing to do is to focus first with the camera up nice and high so it's easy to do that. Secondly, then don't bump that focus ring and set up your composition. And that's what I've done now. I put the camera nice and low down to the ground because I want the tractor to stand out into the night sky. So I've got it down low. It's probably about 600 millimeters off the ground, a little bit more. And I'm just about ready to fire off a heap of shots. Remember I said before, I'm going to fire off a number of shots and stack them for noise reduction. That's because I know this camera is very, very noisy. Uh, the sensor is nowhere near as good as my later model full frame Nikons. And uh, to be honest with you, if you want the very best performance in a camera, you've got to go for a better quality sensor. And that nearly always, nine, nine and a half times out of 10, is going to be a full frame sensor. But the purpose of this exercise is to see how we go with this um, kit lens, kit camera. So let's give it a go, see what we can come up with. Now there isn't really a set formula for this process, but I decided to take about 10 shots in quick succession to hopefully give the software a good chance of stacking each one without any problems. Okay, now I've taken those shots. Uh, I took 10 in total of the, of the sky, and I'm gonna blend those in sequitur as I said before. Now what I'm going to do is without moving my tripod and anything else, 
I'm going to do some fine art light painting on the old tractor. It doesn't matter what camera and lens I use, I always do this because it brings out so much more detail. So what I'm going to do is stop down the aperture to f5 because f5 is going to be a much sweeter spot on this lens, it's going to be a lot sharper and clearer than it was at f3.5. Not much, but it's enough to give it a bit of detail. The other thing I'm going to do is drop the ISO to 500. Why do I do that? Much less noise, much less grain in the image, a much crisper image. And then I'm going to light paint from different angles on the tractor, and I'm going to do that right now. And then when I get back into the software later on, I'll uh, blend those into the original picture with the with the sky and hopefully it all comes together really well. So let's get into it. Now one thing I didn't mention before, but I always use a remote shutter release and I've done so in this case as well. And what that does, it gives you a really smooth shutter actuation without having to touch the camera. And especially for all these different uh, angles and things that I'm shooting, uh, it makes it so much more practical and easy to do. Okay, so I think the capture process is complete. We're going to say goodbye to this old girl and make our way back to the studio and get these images on the computer and have a look and see how we've gone. All right, well, it's the next day here back in the editing studio. I've loaded the images onto the computer, so let's see what we can do with them. Okay, well, here we are. We've uh, already opened up Lightroom and imported all of the images into Lightroom. Now you'll notice here that I've done a, uh, some adjustments on this image here. I've increased the exposure, plus 90. I've also done, I haven't done much more than that. The other thing I did was um, noise reduction, plus 31 on luminance and contrast, and I've enabled the lens profile corrections down here. That's all I've done to that image. Oh, actually what I did, I adjusted the white balance slightly because I didn't like all the greenness in this image. I still don't, but I'll just leave it as is just for the moment. Now, what I've done down here is uh, taken 10, there you go, I've selected all of the 10 images which were of the night sky, and what I'm going to do there is actually uh, export those as TIFF files. So here we go, export, um, and you can see that export folder here. I've called them sky TIFF images, uh, and I've sent them off to a, a folder, so we're going to do that now. and. Um, when that's done, the next job is to open up Sequator or Sequator. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that, but anyway. Um, so I'm just going to leave a Lightroom there for a moment. Open up Sequator. Here we go. And this is what it looks like. Now, it's going to ask me for uh, star images up here. So what I'm going to do is open up the folder where they are located because I just exported them out of um, Lightroom press open, there we go. So there we go, we've got all of the images, you can see 10 of them up the top here. And the only other thing it needs here from me at this point in time is an output. Where do I want to send these to? So I'll just double click on that and I'll um, find the folder, here we go, and call that um, sequitur um, output. Doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you know where to find it. That's the main thing. Now. Here what we're going to do is just quickly go through a couple of the settings. Um, firstly, down the bottom here. Uh, what I want to do here is align stars. So I'll click that here. And accumulation, freeze ground down here. Very important because I want to freeze the foreground here. And I've done that. Now the sky region, double click that and it's set to irregular mask and that's exactly what I want because that's going to give me the uh, ability to trace around the foreground as best I can. I'm going to show you how to do that now. So when you click with the mouse, I'm using the left mouse here, as you can see I'm rubbing out the, the, the sky and I've got to get down as close to that ground as possible without rubbing the ground out. Uh, there are quite a few tutorials on how to use this software. It's really quite basic. Um, 
But anyway, I'm just going to make that mouse a little bit smaller and try and get in as close as I can down here. Now, one of the things that I've practiced a little bit with this software is actually, and I'll do it with this one because you can see in the middle of the, the tractor here, there's um, a fair bit of area there where it's really hard to get into because of the, the structure. So what I'm going to do is just get in there nice and tight as best as I can. And you can see I'm probably overlapping slightly. And so the point of this that I'm trying to show you here is I'm going to go over it a fraction and then go back and I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. I'm going to go back and you can see there I've got the top of the trees. Now the theory here is you don't go over the top of the trees. Now I'm deliberately going over the trees here because I want to show you my little trick here. Um, <clears throat> and the trick is when you right click and you can sort of paint the trees back in. So my plan here, because sometimes it's hard to see this foreground where it starts and stops. So my plan here is to sort of uh, cover it over again. So I've gone over it deliberately so I can go back and just cover it. And there you go, you can see what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get around this structure as close as I possibly can to get these trees here. The idea of this software is that it's going to freeze the foreground and line up all of the stars. Now remember there's 10 layers of stars as per when we shot our um, shots last night out in the field. All right, now that looks pretty good. It's really hard to be totally accurate with this, but I don't think it needs to be too much more accurate than that. Where's the top of that chimney? Yeah, there it is. So I'll just put it back in again. As you can tell, I'm, I'm not being all that fussy. I'm going to try and do it as best I can. But anyway, here we go. So I think we're just about ready to, to let the software do its thing. Um, I'm just making sure it's all covered over. Yep, that looks pretty good. So what I do now is, so you can see that what I've done is I've selected all of the sky and made sure that the foreground is still covered by these, these uh, horizontal uh, angled lines. Go down the bottom here, press start. Now, I'm not quite sure how long this will take, but it's very, very quick, this software. Uh, now, by the way, this software is only available for Windows operating systems. Uh, if you're on a Mac, Starry Landscape Stacker which I've never used because I don't use a Mac, but I've heard excellent reports. I think it's a very, very good program. I think it's about $40 to buy or thereabouts, um, as opposed to this one, Sequator or Sequator, however you want to say it, which is free. And you can't get much better than that, can you? So let's just let it go through its uh, thing here and we'll wait. Okay, so there we go. It's taken one minute, 20 seconds to do all of that. Uh, just press close on that and you'll see the image come up. Now, that looks pretty good just to the naked eye at the moment. I think um, excellent actually. So, what I'm going to do is close this program down. Let's save that into the folder that I, that I suggested before. So, we'll just leave it where it is. Now, what I'm going to do is go back to Lightroom. So, here we are back in Lightroom. Now, you'll remember last night that I shot um, a number of light painted foreground images and you can see them here. I did probably about five or six but I'm only going to use three of them because I only need to use three. So what I'm going to do here is select those three and you can see them there down the bottom on the timeline. I'm going to right click on one of them, go up to edit in, open as layers down the bottom here in Photoshop. And when I click on that it's going to open Photoshop and open those three images as layers in Photoshop. So let's just wait for that to happen. Okay, so you can see we have our three layers there opened up in Photoshop. Let's just make it a little bit bigger so we can see them all. There they are, three layers. Now, what I want to do now is import the background sky layer from Sequitor that we just uh, created. So I'm going to go up to File, Open, uh, go to the folder which is Sky Images, Sequitur Output, there it is. TIFF file, press open, and that's now opened up in Photoshop. So, what I'm going to do is basically cut and paste. So, um, I'm going to copy that layer and paste it into this um, selection. Now, you can see I've now got four images over here. I'll just call that one 
sky, just so we know what it is. And I'm going to drag that one down to the bottom. Okay, so we can only see what's on the top here if you know Photoshop at all. Now, what I'm going to do here is actually um, select the top three layers. I'm running through this fairly quickly because I don't want this video to be too long. Top three foreground layers are all selected. I'm going to change the blend mode to lighten. And there what will happen is you can see through all of the layers. Now, you can still see all the light painting and all those stars that, that we don't want to be there. But in effect, you can see what we're aiming for here. Suddenly you can see the light painting foreground and just see how, how sharp and clear that is. It's really, really crisp. And that's the advantage of doing this separate light, pay, uh, light painting on these layers. It's really, really sharp, really, really good quality image. Remember we stopped down to F5 um, and the ISO down to 500. It makes a huge difference to the quality of these foregrounds. Okay, so what I'm going to do is turn off the bottom three layers and I'm just working on the top layer here. I'm going to add a layer mask, which is here on the bottom there. See the, the white boxes appeared there? Then I'm going to go up to uh, the brush here, brush tool, and I'm going to go for a fairly hard brush, a very hard brush, and a fairly big brush because I want to quickly rub out this sky. And I'll make sure that's on 100% here. Apologise if I'm going too quickly, but um, I don't want to spend all day editing images. I just want to show you the basics of what I'm trying to do here. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically just rubbing out the sky. If you can see what I'm doing, and it's deliberately done in a fairly rough manner because I want to show you the technique, how easy this actually is. Um, all right, so there we go. I can't really see the edges too well on that. Um, to do that, I've probably got to zoom in a little bit. So I'll do that just so we can see the edge of the, make sure I've, there's a, by the way, You'll notice there's a whole lot of hot pixels in this image. That was because it was so hot last night when I was shooting this. It was really, really warm. And these, uh, one of the disadvantages of crop sensors is they, they show a lot of noise. But anyway, I'm not too worried about that at this point. That doesn't bother our, our um, purpose of what we're doing here. All right, now that looks pretty bad until I enable the background layer and have a look at that suddenly we've got something happening here that looks okay. So what I'm going to do now is um, go to the second layer and to save time here I'm going to copy that layer mask just by holding alt down and dragging it down to the next layer and you can see there what I've done I've chopped off the top of that tractor there so I'll just paint it back in. Once again I apologize for moving quickly here but I want to make sure you see what I'm doing. I'm going to enable the third layer here and copy that layer mask I just did there and drag it down, holding down Alt whilst I do that. And it's copied that layer mask from this one to that one. And there you are. You can see straight away we've got this awesome image with these three light painted foreground layers. And you can see when I turn them on and off what happens. See how they appear and there's just bits and pieces and the background isn't affected at all by that. And at this point you can do all sorts of edits to your creative uh, whim, I guess. And one of the things that, that you might like to do is just dull some of that down a little bit by changing the black and white over here, the black and white box. So that, that, that looks pretty good to me. Now, one of the things I often do with my images, you can see I've highlighted the sky image here. Because I don't really like that green sky, I'm just going to put a um, adjustment layer called a photo filter onto that. Now, that defaults to this orange color. But if I change that, click on it and change it to blue, see how it's changed the color of the sky? And it's only a fairly subtle change, to be honest. But you can see now it's not green anymore, it's blue. So that's this layer mask here called a photo filter. Just taking that green tinge out of the sky. And at this point in time, I can do a lot more editing to that image. There might be bits and pieces of this grass down here I don't want in the image. But as it stands at the moment, that's how I blend and layer these images together. Now the sky is pretty good. It's far better than it would have been. I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you an image without the sequitur and without this layer masking technique, and I'll be able to compare the two images. But as it stands at the moment, I'm pretty happy with that. So I've now got, as you can see, five layers here. 
what I want to do is actually, um, if I'm happy I don't want to come back and edit this again, I'd, I'd um, hit a layer up here, go right down the bottom and press flatten image. And I'm actually going to do that because for the purpose of this exercise, I know I'm not going to be coming back to edit this image. So you see how it's flattened into one image? So now I cross out of Photoshop and uh, it asks me if I want to save that. I say yes. And it's now going to take me back to Lightroom. And you'll see it open up here in Lightroom and there it is. Now, once you're back in Lightroom, uh, there's a few more edits you can do if you want. I'm just going to do a really quick gradient here. You can see I've adjusted the exposure here down to take a bit of that brightness out of the, the grass there at the front because I like to bring the focus into the subject itself. You can see just using a gradient tool there and adjusting the exposure. It looks like there's more of a spotlight on the actual tractor itself. Uh, press F for full screen and there's our final shot which I think looks pretty good. Now remember this was shot with a crop sensor camera with a kit lens. Now the key to this is I stacked those 10 sky layers to get a far far crisper sky. Then I stopped down the aperture and stop down the ISO to light paint the foreground. Light painting foregrounds create so much more detail and it is such a fantastic way of shooting. Now, just keep that image in, the, in your forefront for a minute. I wanna show you an image I, uh, that's one single image which I shot out in the field last night. You can see how grainy and dirty and oh, blurry, it's terrible. Nowhere near nowhere near as good as the light painted version. You see all the noise in the sky and there's even noise in the, in the tractor itself. So, you know, it does make a huge difference. We'll go back to our original image again. So I know I've rushed through that and I know that I've made it look really simple and you guys will say, what? How did you do that? Uh, happy to answer any questions on it. But as it stands at the moment, this is an example of what can be achieved with a crop sensor camera, with a kit lens, and I hope you guys enjoyed that. All right, well, I'm pretty happy with how that's come up in the end. I'd be really interested in your thoughts. So why don't you leave a comment down below? I'd be happy to read them and answer any questions that you may have regarding the image. All right, and if you'd like to subscribe to my channel, I'd love to have you on board. And I really appreciate that you tune in and watch the videos. So until next time, I'll see you later.